I want to welcome you to the evening service of Community Baptist Church. It's a delight to be with you, and as we come into your home or as you're in the automobile or wherever you might be, we welcome you and greet you in that name that's above every name, the name of our wonderful Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't you thankful that we know Him, that we can turn to Him and call upon Him and know that He's there to hear and answer our prayers? And we ask Him for His will to be done, that He might be glorified through it all. Well, today I want to bring a message that I've entitled, Privilege or Penalty? Is the Christian life a privilege or is it a penalty? Before we get into the Word of God, let's bow our hearts together in a word of prayer, asking the Lord for His direction. Our loving Father, we do thank You for the precious Word of God that's a lamp to our feet and a guide to our footsteps. We thank You for each one that is joined with us. And as we study the Scriptures together, I pray that the Lord Jesus would be exalted and that Your will might be done in each of our lives. May the Lord Jesus be exalted. May souls be saved. May God's people be strengthened and blessed. And we'll thank you for what you do because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I, I, I'm glad I'm a, a Christian. Are, are, are you? I'm glad I've been saved by the grace of God and that I'm kept by the power of God. I'm thankful that I'm indwelt by the Spirit of God. And I'm thankful that I can walk under the protection and guidance of the Lord Himself. I'm delighted to be in the family of God. And if you know anything about the Christian life and you've been saved by the grace of God, you too are thankful that you are a member of God's family. Unfortunately, the, the world does not view Christianity in that light. They, they believe that we as Christians are missing out on a lot of fun that we've been deprived and we've been uh, hedged, hedged in and we're missing out on all the fun that they are able to have and all the places that they are able to go. They, they think that we're bound by, by rules and by regulations and stipulations and, and restrictions that keep us from doing the very things that they do that they think is fun. We can't go out and get drunk like they do is what the world sees when they look at a Christian. Well, I'm thankful I can't do that, and I don't want to do that. I'm thankful that God has delivered me from that. And I don't have to be concerned about waking up in the morning with a, with a headache and a hangover, and I don't have to be concerned about who I run into when I tried to get home from the beer garden. I don't have to be concerned about depriving my family of food because I, I, I wasted it all on liquor and booze and strong drink. I, I'm glad I'm a Christian and I don't have to go to the places of the world in order to find fun and excitement. They think that we can't get high on drugs like they do. I've seen people high on drugs. I, I've seen the damage that it can do. I, I see the heartache that it can bring. I see the trouble that it sows along the course of life, and even some that have died because of it. I'm thankful I'm a Christian, and I don't need the drugs and the, uh, and the substitutes that the world offers in order to get a high or to get some emotional feeling in my life. They think that as a Christian, we're deprived and we can't enjoy the, the sexual pleasures that some people enjoy outside of, of marriage. I'm thankful that God sees it differently. I'm thankful that as a Christian, we don't need that, that uh, promiscuity and that, uh, that lifestyle in order to be happy or uh, to be enjoying life. We can't get rid of unwanted, ba unwanted babies like they do. I, I, I have no time for the abortion crowd. I have no time for politicians that would vote in favor of abortion, passing laws, making it available and not restricting it. I, I, I wouldn't vote for a man that stands on the platform of abortion. We, we don't need that in order to find happiness and contentment and joy and, and fun in life. The Christian life is far better than that. We don't have to swear and cuss and tell dirty jokes in order to find pleasure in this life. They think that, well, you're required to go to church. 
My, you go Sunday morning, you go Sunday night, you go Wednesday night, you go to revival meetings and missionary conferences. All you get done is going to and from church. You have to read your Bible. You have to, you have to pray. You have to give. Those things is the way the world looks at it. We count it a privilege to be able to go to church. We count it a privilege to be able to read our Bibles. We count it a privilege to be able to pray. We, we count it a privilege to give to the work of God. How do you see Christianity? Do you see it as a privilege or do you see it as a penalty? The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and in verse number 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. That word grievous there means burdensome. What God requires and what God has instructed us to have in our life and uh, to walk in the truth of His Word, what He has given to us is not a burden. It, it's, it's not cruel and, and severe. It's not something that is abusive. The very things, the very commandments that God has given to us is so that you and I might really know the joy of life. He said, I've come to, that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. God's commands protect us from all the hurt and damage that will come into a person's life when they ignore those commands. They think that the world thinks that rules and regulations is all we have to, to live on. Being a Christian, is, is it a privilege to you? Or do you see it as a penalty? Have you really stopped to consider what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ? The, the Apostle Paul opened up the treasure chest of blessing and began to share some things that he was thankful for and, and things that God's people ought to be thankful for. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and beginning with verse number 4, the Apostle Paul said, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything we are enriched by Him, in all utterance and in all knowledge. Even the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in, in, in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall confirm also you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm reminded that we are indeed blessed as God's people. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 10 and verse number 22, The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and it addeth no sorrow with it. Ephesians 1 and verse number 3, the Apostle Paul said that we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. We, we are given a, a, a treasure chest of, of excitement and, and blessing and favor that comes as a result of being saved by the grace of God. We, we are literally made rich in Christ. I know the world measures riches by the amount of money that you have in the bank or the kind of house that you live in or the make and model of the automobile that you drive. But I'm talking about something that is of far greater value than what the world has to offer and what the world seems to think they need in order to be happy. I'm talking about the riches that we have in Christ, the blessings that we have in Him. We enjoy wonderful benefits. The, the first thing that I see in this passage of Scripture is the provision of His grace. Paul said in verse number 4, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Christ Jesus. Grace is God's kindness toward those undeserving of His favor. You and I do not deserve a single thing that God gives to us. We are undeserving. We cannot earn them. We are not able to live in such a way that God is obligated to bless us. I, I'm simply saying to you that God's kindness reaches out to us. Those that are, are, are not worthy of what He does, He blesses you. He blesses me. 
because of the grace of God. His, his grace is a manifestation of His great love that He has for us. I, I never get over the fact that God loves us. I can understand why we love Him, but why God would ever love me is beyond my comprehension. Grace provides us salvation. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. His grace provides us abundant blessing. That's what Paul was saying in the book of Ephesians, that we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. You can read through the book of Ephesians and see the, the wonderful blessings and, and benefits that come to us out of that great treasury chest of blessing that God gives to the born-again believer. It's because of His grace that our sins are forgiven. They're under the blood. You talk about a blessing. You talk about something to shout about. You talk about something to be thankful for. You talk about a benefit of being in the family of God. All, all, A-double-L, -L, all, all of our sins are forgiven and gone and never to be charged against us. Because of His grace, we have hope for the future. We know how this is all going to end. We know the outcome of this. We've read the last chapter. And, and we know that we're on the winning side. Because of His grace, He, he gives us ability to, to serve Him, to work for Him, to labor for Him. Because of His grace, He provides us stability in life. We don't have to be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine and unstable in the circumstances of life. God's grace provides stability for us. God's grace provides spiritual growth for us. We're to grow in that grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we are blessed people. Are you thankful for that? Or do you view the Christian life as a penalty? The second thing that I see here is that we have been blessed with the promise of His blessings. The Bible tells us in verse number 5 of 1 Corinthians number 1, that in everything ye are enriched by Him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. In the book of Psalms chapter 84 in verse number 11, the Bible says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will He withhold from them that walk uprightly. You know what that says to me? God wants to bless you. God wants to open up that great, great store chest that He has in heaven and open the windows of heaven and pour out blessing after blessing after blessing. Do you see the Christian life as a privilege or do you see it as a penalty? We have the promises of God. I feel a shout coming on right now. You and I are abundantly blessed because He has given us His grace and because He has promised His blessing. Everything that you and I need in order to live a life of victory is provided in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. In the book of 2 Peter chapter Chapter 1, the Bible says, According as His divine power hath given unto us all things, underscore that in your Bible, all things, nothing withheld. We're not coming short in any area of life. All things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Everything that you and I need to live a life of victory, a life of overcoming, a life of abundant blessing, has been promised to us and given to us because of Jesus Christ. He, he enables us to speak for Him. That's what Paul is saying in verse number 5 of our text. That in everything ye I am, in all utterance. In other words, you and I have the privilege of, of speaking for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a great downfall of many, many, many Christians today that fail to speak up for the Lord. I, I, I'm sure that there are those that say, I, I know I should. There, there are those that might stand on the platform and say, well, I, I just don't know what to say. Someone else might come along and say, well, I, I know I should. I, I, I don't even know how to say it. I, I, I don't have the training that's necessary in order to 
speak up for the Lord. Witnessing is not optional for the child of God. It's a command that has been given to us. In Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8, the Bible says, Ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. I think of those early Christians in Acts chapter 4, when they were threatened and when they were beaten and when they were commanded not to speak in the name of Jesus anymore. Did they go home and shut the door and say, Lord, we've been abused. We've been mistreated. They're, they're threatening us and we can't speak in your name anymore. Just, just help us, Lord, to not be invaded by them. Oh, no, no, no. The early disciples and followers of Jesus, when they were threatened and when they were beaten, they said, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness we may speak thy word. Verse number 30 of Acts chapter 4, by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child Jesus. And when they have prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God in boldness. Are, are, are you trying to find a way out of witnessing for the Savior? Are, 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 are you praying that God would open doors and opportunities to tell others about Jesus? The early church prayed for boldness. Even in light of the fact that they were threatened, they, they were beaten, and they were commanded not to speak in that name anymore, that did not stop them. Not only has God commanded us to do so, but I believe the Bible very clearly teaches us that He's given us the knowledge or the ability to do so. He tells us in that same passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, that in everything ye are enriched by Him in all utterance and in all knowledge. God not only wants us to speak up for Him, but He gives us what we need to speak up for Him. He gives us understanding and insight into the Scriptures. Now, the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness unto him. He looks at it as not necessary and un, un, unneeded in his life. But we that are in Christ, we, we're able to see and understand and comprehend what God is saying to us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit because God's Word is spiritually discerned. Thank God He not only commands us to speak, but He gives us the knowledge on what to say when we speak. That's a blessing. Do, do you view that as a blessing from God and a privilege to be in the family of God? Or do you see the Christian life as a penalty, as a bunch of rules and restrictions that prevent us from really enjoying this life? My dear friend, we are blessed people. And the third thing that I see in this passage of Scripture, we are blessed because we're able to participate in the ministry. The Bible tells us in verse number 7, so that ye come behind in no gift. In other words, God's people are gifted. You and I have been gifted to participate in the work of God. There's not one Christian in the church that has not been given a special gift that they are to exercise and use to build the church, to encourage one another, to be a blessing to one another, to minister to one another. We have a gift. And if we're not using that gift, there's going to be a weakness in the church that will be a place of vulnerability for Satan's attack. We are gifted to serve. We've not been gifted to sit around a church and do absolutely nothing. God has gifted us in order to roll up our sleeves and go to work. When Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica, he praised them and was thankful for them because they had a labor of love. They were workers for the Lord. They served the Lord. Out of love in their heart and devotion to Christ, they rolled up their sleeves and went, went to work. Now, if you turn over in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 
you'll find out that the source of those gifts is the Holy Spirit. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. The Bible tells us in verse number 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. And then he tells us in verse number 11, But all these worketh that one and the selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. The very source of our spiritual gift that we are to use in the work of God comes from the Holy Spirit. Not only do we see in the Word of God the source of those gifts, but we see the purpose of those gifts. In the book of Romans, the, the book of Romans, the, the Bible tells us that we've been equipped with certain gifts in order to be a blessing to one another. In the book of Romans chapter 12 and beginning with verse number 4, the Bible talks about those gifts. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the portion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. The source of those gifts, the Holy Spirit. The purpose of those gifts, to serve the Lord. Now, our usefulness in the work and service of the Lord is dependent upon three important factors, all recorded for us in this passage of Scripture. The first thing is that we need a proper attitude of humility. We will never be effective servants of the Lord if we're puffed up and feel pretty good about ourselves. When, when we boast and brag about our abilities and our place in the work of God, when, when we look upon others and see ourselves as being better than they, we lose our effectiveness in serving the Lord. The Bible says in verse number 3, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of, of faith. We will never be effective in serving the Lord if we're filled with pride and arrogance and boast and brag about ourselves. The second thing that I see, if we're going to be effective in serving the Lord, we not only need a proper attitude of humility, but we need a proper perspective of the church. The Bible says in verse number four, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Is that the way you view the church? We're one body. We're, we're one body. We're one people. Those that have been saved by the grace of God have been brought into the family of God, and we form one body. No one is any better than anybody else. We've been saved by the grace of God, we, we were sinners that needed saved. God brought us in, brought us into his family by the new birth. And as a result of that, we are called to serve him. And a proper perspective of the church and seeing the importance of the church and the value of the church and the ministry of the church and the encouragement that we are to be to one another in the church. That's the only way that you and I can ever, ever be effective in serving the Lord. So, a proper attitude of humility, a proper perspective of the church. And then the third thing that I see, if we're going to be useful in the work of the Lord, is a proper use of our gift. The Bible tells us in these verses the gifts that the Holy Spirit dispenses to the believers. If you fail to use your gift, there's a weakness in the church. Now remember, we're one body, we're one people, ministering to one another and being an encouragement and help to one another. And if you're not exercising your gift and what God has gifted you with, then there's a weakness in the church. We're to minister to one another. We're, we're blessed people. I mean, we are really blessed. 
God has gifted us to serve Him, to work for Him, to labor for Him. Do you see the Christian life as a privilege? Or do you see it as a penalty like the world sees it? The fourth thing that I see here is that God gives us patience to wait. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, as Paul opened this great storehouse of blessing, as he opened this treasure chest of abundant blessing from the Lord, he, he tells us in chapter 1 that God has given us patience waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Waiting. Patience. I'm thankful Jesus is coming again. Are you? We, we, we are waiting for that. We are looking for that. The Bible says looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The Bible says looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. We not only look to Him for daily sustenance, but we look to Him and eagerly wait for Him to come again. We, we wait with great anticipation. Have, have you stopped to think that our waiting is not only to be an anticipation of that event, but it ought to spur activity in our life because of that event. We ought to be motivated to reach souls for the Savior because we know He's coming. We, we ought to be motivated to distribute the precious Word of God because we know the Savior is coming. We, we, ought, to be, we ought to be actively involved and engaged in ministry and teaching others the, the truths of God's precious Word because we know that Jesus is coming again. Now let me just say two things about that. There, there is a verbal message that you and I are to proclaim. And that verbal message is that people must be saved. People must be born again. We need to remind people that they are sinners. We need to be pro broadcasting and proclaiming the truth that sinners need to be saved and that salvation is found in Christ and Christ alone. But not only is there a, a verbal message to proclaim, there is also a visible message to perform. You and I are to live according to the precious Word of God. That's not optional for a Christian. What God has commanded us to do is not to be debated. It's not to be rejected. It's not to be turned from. But what God has commanded us in His Word we are immediately to manifest that in our life so that we are an effective witness in telling others about Jesus. How are you doing there? How am I doing there? What, what a glorious event this will be when Jesus comes again. It's so exciting that it's hard to even talk about. It's going to be such a blessing that our hearts ache and pound for Jesus to come again. We get to go home. This world's not my home. I'm, I, I'm just passing through. My, my treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I, I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Do you know why? Because our citizenship is in heaven. We, we are looking forward to going home. The Bible tells us in John chapter 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my, my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I, I would have told you. I, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye might be also. My, my dear friend, when Jesus comes, we get to go home. Let, let me tell you something else about that. When Jesus comes again to take us home to be with Him, our suffering is over. This life has a lot of pain, a, a lot of disappointment, a lot of frustration, a, a, a lot of things that are hard to bear. But when Jesus comes, I, I feel a shout coming on right now. The pain, the sorrow, the suffering, the disappointments are all over. Our suffering is ended. When Jesus comes again to take us home to be with Him, we get a brand new body. 
The Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 3 and in verse number 20, For our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body, according to the working whereby He is able even to subdue all things unto Himself. With each passing day, I become more aware of this decaying body that, I, that is housing me. It doesn't work the way it used to work. There's new pains, new problems that I encounter each day. It's difficult to deal with. It's difficult to live with. But thank God when Jesus comes again, we get a brand new body that will not be subject to the pain and sickness and disease and problems of life. A brand new body just like Jesus. When he comes to take us home, we're, we're reunited with departed saints. I'm, I'm sure everyone joining in on this message has, has somebody in heaven right now. Rejoice when he comes, and he's coming, his coming is soon. When he comes, we're reunited with loved ones that have gone on before us that were saved by the grace of God. I can't imagine what that reunion is going to be like. When he comes to take us home to be with him, we receive our rewards. When he comes to take us home to be with him, we'll be with our blessed Savior for all eternity. Are, are you prepared for that? Are you ready for that? Are, are you anxiously working and looking forward to that? And are you telling others they need to get ready for that? How do you see the Christian life? Is it a blessing or is it a penalty? How do you see it? The other thing that I see here, this passage of Scripture, is that we are preserved to the end. The Bible tells us in verse number 8, Who shall also confirm you unto the end, that will be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. That word confirmed there means to be preserved. It means to be established. What God is promising us, what, what God is telling us is that I'm going to confirm you. When you get into my family and you're saved and kept by the power of God, I confirm you or I preserve you, I establish you, I make you steadfast, I make you secure to the very end. I, I don't have to be concerned about losing my salvation. It's an eternal salvation. And he has confirmed me and has promised that I'll be there in the end. <laughs> what, a, what a blessing it is to be a child of God. We, we don't need the things of this world to make us happy. We don't need to go to the places of ill repute to make us happy. We, we don't have to join in in what the world calls fun in order to be happy. We are blessed. We are abundantly blessed, overwhelmingly blessed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 6 the Bible says that we're confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. That word perform there means to complete. What he started, he's going to finish. I'm telling you, folks, we are abundantly blessed. It's not a penalty to be a Christian. It's a blessing, a privilege to be a child of God. And then the last thing that I see is that we have the privilege of his fellowship. The Bible says, God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ. His fellowship, our fellowship. That word fellowship there means intimacy. We can have an intimate relationship with the Lord because of the new birth. But it also means partnership. You and I are partners with God. His work has been placed in our hands. And we partner with Him in order to accomplish that for His honor and His glory. When the Lord Jesus finished surveying and scrutinizing the churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, the Bible says in verse number 20 of chapter 3, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. I wonder... Are we having sweet fellowship with the Lord? 
are, are we really close to him? I, I look at that verse of scripture and I, I believe the Lord wants to enter into a closer relationship and fellowship with his people. Some of God's people have pushed him aside. They, they, they've pushed him away. And, and Jesus is knocking at our heart's door, wanting to come in and have good and sweet fellowship with us. When we allow unconfessed sin in our life, we're, we're pushing him away. We're, we're, we're deprived of that sweet fellowship that we're able to have. And, and, and do you notice when we open the door, the promise that he gives, I will come in and sup with you. I'll have fellowship with you. My dear friend, I challenge you today. Don't drive the Lord away, but walk hand in hand with him. I, I'm glad I'm a Christian. Are you? I, I'm, I'm, I, I don't have to feel the way this lost world feels about Christianity. I, I don't think it's a penalty and a, a restriction and, and, and loaded down with rules to prevent us from having any happiness or fun or excitement in life. Every command that God has given is that you and I might have the ultimate joy and victory in and through Christ. It's an honor and a privilege to be a child of God. And I trust, my friend, that's the way you see it as well. Loving Father, we do thank you and praise you for thy precious word. And I, I pray that even right now people will be making decisions that will help them to draw nigh to you, that you in turn might be able to draw nigh to them. Lord, if there's someone that is in the listening audience that needs saved, I pray that they would turn to you and cry out for your gift of eternal life. Lord, I ask your blessing upon this message. May, may the word of God accomplish that which you've purposed to do. And I'll thank you and praise you for what you do, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.